The following historic recording by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones dates from the earliest days of tape recording and was actually recorded on paper tape. However, it has been digitally restored and although the quality is not to modern standards, we hope that you will find it to be a great blessing. As with all Dr. Lloyd-Jones sermons, its relevance for these modern times is undiminished. The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's second epistle to Timothy, the first chapter and the seventh verse. The seventh verse in the first chapter of the second epistle of Paul to Timothy. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In these words, we are directed to yet uh, another cause of this condition that we've been considering together for a number of Sunday mornings, in which we describe in general as spiritual depression. We've indicated each time that there is almost no end and no limit uh, to the ways in which this condition, this disease of the soul, may take us or may attack us. We were emphasizing last Sunday morning that our adversary, the devil, is subtle and can even transform himself into an angel of light. And that is very true. But it is equally true to say of him that he is relentless. I mean by that that he doesn't cease. He doesn't care what methods, what tactics to employ as long as he can bring us down and as as long as he can discredit the work of God. He's not concerned about consistency. He doesn't hesitate to vary his procedure, his approach. He doesn't hesitate to contradict what he had said to us previously. He has but one object and one concern, and that is, I say, to bring to disrepute and discredit the name and the work of God, and especially, of course, the great work of God in our redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When God originally made and created this world, he looked at it and saw that everything was good, and he was well pleased with it. It was perfect. And it was because of that that the devil, in his jealousy and in his malice, was determined to ruin and to mar that work, and concentrated specially upon the supreme work of God, which was the creation of man. If only he could bring men down, well then the acme of creation would be marred. And so he concentrated, as we remember, uh, upon the woman and beguiled her, and she in turn misled her husband, and so men But the story of humanity didn't end at that point. God purposed and planned a great way of redemption. And this is, of course, beyond any question, the outstanding glory of God. Redemption is even a greater work than creation. And especially when we consider the way in which God has achieved it, even through the sending of his only begotten Son, and the marvel and the wonder and the miracle of the Incarnation, and above all, the death upon the cross. This, I say, is the supreme thing. That sinful, fallen men can be redeemed and restored, and in him and through him, and ultimately by him, the whole of creation. So that obviously, the supreme concern of the adversary, the devil, the opponent, is if he can, somehow or another, to bring this work of all work to discredit and to disrepute. And so he makes a special object of attacking the heirs of salvation, Christian peace. And there is nothing which so suits his purpose, therefore, as to depress, to bring us down, to give the impression that this boasted salvation is but a figment of the imagination, and that we who believe it have but believed cunningly devised fables, that it isn't true. And his best way of doing that, of course, is to produce such a condition in us in which we give the impression of being burdened and miserable and wretched and unhappy. And so, 
He specializes, if I may so put it, upon this condition of spiritual depression. Now then, I say all that just to introduce this particular aspect we're looking at this morning. The last two Sunday mornings we've been looking at the past. And we see how the devil depresses people by getting them to concentrate their gaze upon the past and to be living in the past and dwelling in the past. And as they do so, they become depressed. But if that fails, we must anticipate and expect that he will change his procedure entirely and begin to make us look to the future. And so he does. And that's exactly what we have in this particular word that we're looking at this morning. We are going to consider the case of those who are suffering from spiritual depression because they're afraid of the future. Their fear of the future. Now, this again is a very common condition. And it really is, I say, most extraordinary to notice the way in which the enemy produces uh, this self-same fundamental condition in these different ways and often in the same people. When you put them right about the past, they then immediately begin to talk about the future. And the result is they're always depressed in the present. You satisfy them about the forgiveness of sin. Yes, that particular sin, which was so exceptional. Yes, they're clear about that. You've even shown them that though they've wasted the years, he will restore the years that the locust has eaten. They're quite happy about the past, but then they say, Ah, yes, but... And then they begin to talk about their fears concerning the days that lie ahead. Well, now there are many instances of this in the scripture, and there is a great deal of teaching with respect to this in the scripture. But I'm sure that I'm right when I say that the supreme example of this particular condition is undoubtedly this man, Timothy, to whom the apostle wrote this epistle and the first epistle. Uh, There is no question at all, I say, that it was his peculiar trouble. And uh, there is no doubt at all that the Apostle wrote both the letters to him because of that. He was one of those men who was very dependent upon Paul for that very reason. And the uh, whole object of both the epistles is to put Timothy right with respect to this problem of facing the future. Now, I don't want to spend the time with Timothy, so let us take it in general. And what I shall be saying in general is in particular true of Timothy. What are the causes of this condition? Why is it that people suffer from this uh, fear of the future? What, what, are, what are the reasons which they give for it? What, what, what are the particular aspects of the difficulty and the problem uh, which they tend to manifest and about which they're always speaking? Well, there can be no doubt that first and foremost here we must put temperament. Their particular makeup. We're all born differently. No two of us are exactly the same. We have our own uh, peculiar characteristics. We have our virtues, we have our uh, failures, our weaknesses, our blemishes. The human person is very delicately and finely balanced. Fundamentally, we all, of course, have the same traits and the same general characteristics, but the relative proportions vary tremendously from case to case. And the result is that we all have different temperaments. That's true, isn't it? It's obvious. Now, I say that uh, it's very important that we should bear that in mind. Ah, but says someone, surely we are Christians now. And uh, when you become Christian, all that is demolished. Now, that is the essential fallacy in this respect is to assume that that is so. It isn't so. There is no profounder change in the universe than the change which we describe as regeneration. But regeneration, the work of God in the soul, in which he implants the principle of divine and spiritual life, even that does not change a man's temperament. Your temperament still remains the same. Or if you prefer it, I can put it like this. The fact that you become a Christian does not mean that you cease to have to live with yourself. You will have to live with yourself as long as you're alive. And yourself is yourself. And not somebody else yourself. 
To become Christian, I say, doesn't change our temperament. It remains. Was the same essential man after his salvation and conversion as he was before. He didn't become somebody else. Peter is still Peter. John is still John. Temperamentally, the essential characteristics. And that's where the glory of the Christian life comes in. It's like God's variety in nature and creation. Look at these flowers. No two of them are identical. It's in the variety and yet the fundamental unity God displays and manifests the glory and the wonders of his ways. And it's exactly the same in the Christian church. We're all different. We're all Christian. And yet we're all ourselves. Our temperaments are different. And therein, I say, resides one of the great glories of the church. As God uh, uh, distributes his gifts uh, through the Holy Spirit in a diverse manner, so our essential personality remains exactly what it was. And I mean by personality or temperament, the peculiar way in which we do things. We do the same things, but we do them different. Now that's it. We all must do the same things as Christians. But the way in which we do them is essentially different. Think of the difference in preachers, preaching the same gospel, living the same Christian life. Yes, but their manner of presentation is different and is meant to be different. And God uses these differences in order to spread the gospel. He can use one man to appeal and to make the message appeal to one. The other person could not be used in that respect. Different types appeal to different people, and rightly so. And God uses all this. So I say, we put first and foremost temperament. And there are some people who by temperament are nervous, apprehensive, Timorous, uh, tend to be frightened. Paul himself was an instance of this. Paul was a very nervous man. There was no self-confidence about Paul in that sense. He goes to Corinth in weakness, fear, and much trembling. He didn't rely upon himself and his organization and his power, not at all. He was nervous. He was a naturally timorous, frightened man. Without were fightings, within were fears, he says again. That's the man by nature. Well, now, this was specially true of Timothy. And there are people who are born like that. There are other people who are self-confident and assured. They're afraid of nothing. They'll tackle anything. They'll stand up anywhere. Nothing. They don't know what nerves mean. The two people are Christian. And yet, in that respect, they differ vitally and fundamentally. There are some people, it's extremely difficult to get them to speak at all. And there are the opposite. Thus I say that this question of temperament is a very important one in our consideration of the precise and the exact cause of this trouble. But then there are other things which emerge as you consider the case of such people. They're uh, always concerned about the nature of the task. They've got a very high impression and opinion of the Christian call. I'm simply giving you now what these people are so fond of saying. They've got an exalted idea of the Christian life. These people always realize that it's not an easy thing to be a Christian. It's not just being converted and then reclining on a bed of roses for the rest of it. No, they can see it as a high calling and the fight of faith. They see the exalted character of the life. They see that it means following Christ. They read their New Testament, they're intelligent people invariably, and they're aware of the greatness of the task, the highness of the calling. And that in turn tends to depress them, because they're so acutely aware of that greatness and of their own smallness. In other words, they have a great fear of failure. They're afraid of letting down the cause. Ah, oh, they say, I like that gospel. And I believe my sins are forgiven. I want to be a Christian, but oh, I'm so afraid that I'll fail. It's all very well to say in a meeting, yes, but uh, I've got to live and I know myself and I know the task and uh, I know the difficulties. They're afraid of failure. They want to be, they'd like to be, yes, but uh, they don't want to let down God, as it were, and let down the Lord Jesus Christ and let down the church. Who are they to live such a life? The greatness of the task, this acute awareness of their own deficiencies and their own lack. 
or it may be that they just suffer from a kind of general fear of the future. And it often is this. They can't put their finger on anything. You say, well, what is it in particular you're afraid of? Well, they, they just don't know. But uh, they've got this general fear and apprehension and apprehensiveness with respect to the future. Things that may happen. Things they may be called upon to suffer. I've often had to deal with people who come to me and have said something like this. They say, well, uh, yes, I, I, I do believe, but I, I don't know that I can call myself a Christian. Well, I say, why? Why can't you? I've even had a case like this put to me. I remember a lady once telling me, he put it in this form. She said, you know, I've been reading about uh, people in the past and even people at the present who are being persecuted for Christ's sake. And uh, I've thought of myself having to face that position. I remember this particular person putting it in this form. She had a little boy, age three, I think it was at the time. She said, you know, if it really ever became a question with me of uh, denying my faith or giving up this boy, I don't know what I'd say. I don't think I'd be strong enough. I doubt whether I'd have the courage to put Christ first at all fast and suffer anything, even death if necessary. I doubt that I could do it, and therefore felt she had no right to call herself a Christian. Now, she had never been called upon to do this, she'd never been persecuted in that active form, but she'd conjured up the vision of this possibility, and it was depressing her. She was bound. She wasn't enjoying the Christian life, wondering whether she was even a Christian at all. Spiritual depression. Fear of an unknown future. Even imaginary fear. Well, we mustn't stay with this uh, description. The remarkable thing is this. That it is possible for such things so to grip us as to paralyze us completely in the present. Uh, such people are ever in danger of being so absorbed and by these fears that they really become more or less ineffective. Now, there was no doubt at all that that was the essence of the trouble with Timothy. Paul was in prison. And Timothy began to wonder what was going to happen to him. What if Paul is going to be put to death? How can we go on without him? Who can I rely on? There's my whole future and here is my master and my teacher, my father in the faith, going. Difficulties in the church. Persecution beginning to show itself. He himself might be involved. What's going to happen? So Paul has to be quite firm with him and tells him that he must not be ashamed of him or of his suffering. Uh, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. That was undoubtedly the essence of his thought. Well, now the question is, how are we to deal with this condition? How is this condition to be treated? Well, once more, I can't think of anything better than to adopt the procedure we adopted last Sunday. There are certain preliminary general things before we come to the precise scriptural teaching. So I would lay down certain propositions like this. The first thing here again is to discover and to know exactly where to draw the line between legitimate forethought and paralyzing worry. Now, it is right to think about the future. We are supposed to think about the future. It's a very foolish person who doesn't think at all about the future. Ah, yes, but what we are always warned against in the scripture is to be worried about the future. Take no thought for the, for the morrow means uh, don't be guilty of anxious care about tomorrow. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you take no thought. Otherwise, the farmer wouldn't plow in the spring and sow the seed and harrow and so on. He just waits for something. He doesn't. He, by plowing and by harrowing and by sowing and so on, he's looking to the future, and rightly so. But he doesn't spend the whole of his time then worrying as to what's going to happen. No, no, no. He does the work. He takes thought. He does the work and then leaves it. And here, I say, is this whole difficult question again of where to draw the line. Thinking is right up to a point, yes, but if you go beyond that point, it becomes worry and anxiety and it paralyzes and cripples. In other words, I think we can put it like this. It is very right to think about the future. 
it is very wrong to be controlled by the future. That's the trouble. The difficulty with these people is that they're controlled by the future. They're dominated by the future. There they are, wringing their hands, holding their heads in the present, doing nothing, depressed. By what? Well, by fears about the future. In other words, I say they are controlled by the future. They're being governed by the future. They're mastered by the unknown future. Now, that's always wrong. Thinking is right to be controlled by the future is all wrong. Now, there is a fundamental proposition. The world, of course, has discovered this as it has discovered many of these things. The world, in its common sense, tells us not to cross our bridges before we come to them. And it's perfectly right. It's absolutely fine. Put that into your Christian teaching. The world, I say, is right there, and the Christian must accept that wisdom. Don't cross your bridges until you come to them. Indeed, many of these scriptural statements have become proverbial. Take no thought for the morrow, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Perfectly right. That's found at every single level. The New Testament raises that concept, of course, and puts it in its spiritual form. But it's true on the lowest level. The present unto the day is the evil thereof. As I said last week, that it's a waste of time and of energy to be concerned about the past which you can't affect. It is equally wrong to be worrying and concerned about a future which you, at that moment, cannot be dealing with. Live for the present, live for the moment. One step enough for me. Go forward, live in the present to the maximum, and don't allow the future to mortgage your present any more than you shouldn't allow the past to mortgage your present. Very well, now then, there it is on the level of what I'd call common sense and human wisdom. But now let us observe the apostle's method. He takes it above that, he raises us up. He gives his specific teaching. And you notice that it is of a twofold character. First of all, it's a reprimand. And secondly, it is a reminder. Now, both these elements are absolutely vital and essential. The first thing he does is to reprimand Timothy. He turns to him and says, For God does not give him a spirit of huh? Now, that's reprimand. Timothy at the moment was guilty of the spirit of fear. He was gripped by it. He was paralyzed by it. He was in tears about it. So Paul reprimands him, God has not given us the spirit of huh? but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, this can be put, I think, in this form. This is the principle. This is really the doctrine here. That our essential trouble, if we suffer from this particular manifestation, is our failure to realize what God has given us and is giving us, in giving us the gift of the Holy Ghost. That was really the trouble with Timothy. It's the trouble with all at this point. It's a failure to realize what God has done for us, and what God has done and is still doing in us. If you like, I can employ the words that our Lord used in a slightly different connection in addressing uh, uh, James and John, you remember, who wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume uh, a certain village of the Samaritans, he turned to them and he said, Ye know not what spirit ye are. Now that's exactly what Paul is saying here to Timothy. In a different way, there it was negative, here it's positive. So the apostle has to tell Timothy, you see, to stir up the gift of God. Now this condition is due to our failure to stir it up. It's a failure, in other words, to think. A failure to take ourselves in hand. You just find yourself looking to the future and then you begin to say, I wonder what will happen and how can I... You're, you're gripped by the thing. You, you, you don't think, you don't remind yourself of who you are and what you are and this thing overwhelms you and down you've gone. Now the first thing I say is to take a firm grip of yourself. Pull yourself up. Turn up yourself. Take yourself in hand. Seek yourself. And as the Apostle puts it, we have to remind ourselves of certain things. 
And the big thing is this. What Paul, as I understand him, is saying in effect to Timothy is, Timothy, you seem to be thinking of yourself and of life and of all you've got to do as if you were still an ordinary person. But Timothy, you're not an ordinary person. You're a Christian. You're born again. The Spirit of God is in you. You are, you are facing all these things as if you were still what you once were. You are facing life as if you were, well, I can't think of a better term, an ordinary person. And isn't that the trouble with us in this connection? Though we are truly Christian, though we've believed the truth, though we've been born again, though we are certainly the children of God, we lapse into this condition in which we begin to think again as if nothing of this had happened to us at all. Like the men of the world, the men who has never been regenerated, we allow the future to come to us and to dominate us, and we think of our own weakness and lack of strength, the greatness of the calling, the tremendous task, and down we go, as if we were but ourselves. Now then, the thing to do, says the Apostle to Timothy, is to remind yourself that we have been given the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And because of this, our whole outlook upon life and upon the future must therefore be essentially different. We've got to think of everything in a new way. We've got to face everything in a new way. And the way in which we face it all is this. We face it all reminding ourselves that the Holy Spirit is in us. There's the task. There's the high calling. There's the persecution. There is the opposition. There's the enemy. I see it all. I myself am weak. I lack powers and propensities and faculties. But instead of stopping there, I say, yes, I know it all. But. And the moment I add that, but, I'm doing what the apostle wants me to do. I say, that's all true. The Spirit of God is in me. God has given me the Holy Spirit. And the moment I say that, the whole outlook changes. In other words, we've got to learn to say this. That what matters in any of these positions is not what is true of us. It's what is true of him. Oh yes, Timothy was like this by nature, as I've been saying, and he was weak, and the, the enemy was powerful, and the task was great. Yes, but you mustn't think of yourself, Sir Paul. Don't think in terms of yourself. God has not given us, he's given you, the Spirit. You don't think of yourself, think of the Spirit. Now then, it is when we come to that, you see, we balance our doctrine and see the whole thing completely. I took some time at the beginning to emphasize the fact that all our temperaments are different. And I want to emphasize it again. But at this point I say this. That though all our temperaments are different, our temperaments do not make any difference at all face to face with the task. Now here is the miracle of redemption. We are, be, we are given our temperaments by God. All our temperaments are different. That is again of God. Yes. But what must never be true of us as Christians is that we are controlled by our temperament. We must be controlled by the Holy Ghost. You see, you put them in that order. Here are your powers and capacities. There is your particular temperament that uses them. Yes, but as a Christian, above that you put the Holy Spirit. And what is so fatally wrong in a Christian is to be controlled by his temperament. The natural man is always controlled by his temperament. He can't help himself. But the difference that regeneration makes is that there is a higher control even above temperament. And the moment you bring in the Holy Spirit, the temperament doesn't matter at all. Because he enables, as we're going to see, yes, but he even enables you then to do it in your particular way and through your temperament. That is the miracle of redemption. 
Temperament remains, but temperament no longer controls. The Holy Spirit is in control. Well, now then, let's work it out as Paul does in detail. Let's follow him. God, he says, has not given us the spirit of fear. Well, what is the spirit he's given us? Well, notice. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of... That's what he puts first. And, of course, he puts it first rightly. It's the immediate thing we need. We are aware of the task and the difficulties, our own weakness. It's all right. Here's power, even for a week. What does he mean by this power? Well, it means power in the most comprehensive manner conceivable. Are you afraid that you won't be able to live the Christian life? The answer is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's because of your own weakness and the greatness of the task. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. You see, the fear and trembling remain. That's your temperament. Yes, but you're enabled by the power that works in you both the will and to do. So you don't become a braggart or a boast or a person who's not afraid of anything. No, no, you work it out in fear and trembling. But there's power there in spite of that because it is the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of God working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But you know it has reference not only to this question of living the Christian life and battling with temptation and sin. It means power to endure, power to go on, whatever the conditions, whatever the circumstances. It means power to hold on and to hold out. Yes, let me go further. It means that the most timorous person can be given power if needs be even to You see it in our Lord himself. You see it in the apostles. You see a man like Peter who was afraid of death and so afraid of it that he even denied his Lord. He said, I don't know him. I've got nothing to do with him. He denied with oaths and cursing his own blessed Lord, his greatest benefactor. Why? To save his life, to save his skin. He was afraid of death. But look at him afterwards in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The spirit of power had entered into him, and he's ready to die. He'll face the authorities. He'll face anybody. He was given it. And this is one of the most glorious things in the long annals of the history of the church. It's happened so often sin. I'm never tired of telling you to read the story of the martyrs and the confessors, the Protestant fathers, the Puritans, the covenanters, those are the people. Read their story. And this is what you'll find. You'll find not only strong, courageous men, you'll find weak women and even girls and even little children dying gloriously for Christ's sake. They didn't do it. They couldn't. They were given this spirit of power. Now that's what Paul means. He says, Timothy... But don't speak like that. You're talking like a natural man. You were talking as if you yourself, just as you are with your own powers, had got to face all that. God has given you the spirit of power. Go forward steadily, not worrying. He'll enable you. He'll be with you. He'll surprise you. You won't know yourself. You'll be amazed at yourself one day, perhaps, being put to death and not being frightened at all, but rejoicing even that you've been accounted worthy to suffer shame and even death for his glorious name's sake. <laughs> it's given. And what you and I have to do is, as we are tempted to be depressed by these things, say, but I have the Spirit in me, the Holy Spirit, and he's a spirit of power. Then the next thing he puts, you notice, is love. Now this I find most interesting and fascinating. I wonder how many of us would have put love at this point in our list. This is a sublime piece of psychology. Though. Now why, why do you think he puts in love here and what's he mean by it? God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power. Yes, I can understand that. I need the power. But of love. Why love? It isn't love or this timorous, frightened, nervous, apprehensive person needs. Why does he say that the second thing is that he's the spirit of love? 
Ah, here's the psychology. Now, you have to be cruel to be kind. And I think you've observed in dealing with these conditions every Sunday morning, I have shown you that there is a stern aspect of the teaching and a stern element in it. And it's as we talk about love of all things that the sternness comes in in this particular text. Why does he say the spirit of love? Well, my friends, the answer is this. What is, after all, the main cause of this spirit of fear? And the answer is self. Self-love. Self-concern. Self-protection. Had you realized that? The essence of this trouble is that this person is really too absorbed in self. How can I do this? What if I fail? What if I let down the cause? I. They're constantly turning in upon themselves and looking at themselves and are concerned about themselves. Self-love. And it's here you see the spirit of love comes in. There's only one way to get rid of yourself and that is to be so absorbed in somebody else that you've got no time left to think about yourself. It's the only cure for self. You'll never deal with self yourself. That was the fatal fallacy of the poor men who became monks and anchorites. They could get away from the world and other people, but they couldn't get away from themselves. Yourself is inside you and you can't get rid of him. Do what you like, he's there. The more you mortify yourself, the more self will congratulate you. There's only one way to get rid of self, and that is that you're so absorbed in someone, something else, that you've got no time to think about yourself. And thank God the Holy Spirit makes that possible. For he is not only a spirit of power, but he's a spirit of love. And what does this mean? Well, it means this. Love to God. Love to the great God who made us. Love to the great God who has made the way of redemption for us. Miserable creatures that we are. Miserable sinners who deserve nothing but hell. Contradictory, self-concerned, all that we know to be true of ourselves. He loved us with an everlasting love. Think about that, says Paul to Timothy. And as you become absorbed in the love of God, you'll forget all about yourself. The spirit of love will deliver you from self-interest, self-concern, self-depreciation. For you know, self-depreciation is self and self-concern. It gets rid of self all along the line. And then, having thought of this extraordinary, amazing, eternal love of God, which ever looked upon us in spite of sin, and planned the way of redemption, and spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. You then go on to think of the love of the Son. Its depth, its height, its breadth, and its length, to know the love of Christ, which hath its knowledge. Think of him who came from the courts of heaven and laid aside the insignia of his eternal glory and was born as a babe and worked as a carpenter and endured the contradiction of sinners against himself into whose holy face men spat and onto his brow they pressed the crown of thorn into whose hands and feet the nails were hammered there he is, and what's he doing there, and why is he there? He's for you. That you and I might be forgiven and reconciled to God. Think of his love. And as you know something about it, you'll forget you. And then love of the brethren. Think of other people, their needs, their concerns. Shall I go on with this? Timothy seems to have been saying with himself, if I do, I may be put to death. And then Paul comes to him and says, men, think of love. Look at those people perishing in their sins. They don't know about the gospel. Can you sit down to save your life and those perish? No, don't forget yourself. Go in love. Love for others. Love for the lost. But love for your brethren round and about you in the same way. And love for the greatest and the noblest cause in the world. 
this blessed, this glory of God. Work without for yourselves, my friends. That's what the apostle means, the spirit of power and the spirit of love. And if you're consumed by this spirit of love, well, then you'll forget yourself. You'll say, what matters? For the sake of this God, I'll die. For the Christ who gave himself for me. What is too much for me? The thing that smashed and broke the heart of Count Zinzendorf, you remember. He looked at that portrait that was there over that mantelpiece. And there it was, the Christ who died for him. I did this for thee, what wilt thou do for me? And it broke him and he forgot everything. His love went out and he said, I have one passion only. It is he, it is he alone. The spirit of love. And lastly, the sound mind. Not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What does this mean? Well, it's the right antidote, isn't it, for this condition? Self-control. Discipline. A balanced mind. Though you and I may be hasty and timorous and nervous and lacking in willpower and self-control, the spirit that God has given us is a spirit of control, a spirit of discipline, a spirit of order, a spirit of judgment. You know, our Lord had really said all this before Paul ever thought of it. Paul is just repeating and giving an exposition of our Lord's own teaching. Do you remember what he said to the disciples when he sent them out to preach? He warned them that men might hate them. He said, don't think you're going to preach a popular message. A day may come when you'll have to give up your lives for this. In any case, he said, you can mm. fire for certain, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what he shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what he shall speak. You'll be on trial and in a court, and they'll be doing everything to trap you and to pongle you and to catch you. Don't worry, says our Lord. It shall be given you in that selfsame hour. You needn't be afraid, you won't lose your nerve. You won't be so excited and alarmed and terrified that you'll dither and won't know what to speak. It'll be given you in that self-same hour what you shall speak. The spirit of wisdom, of a sound mind, you'll be given a word to speak. Oh, I can put this point very simply and briefly in one anecdote, in one story. It's the story of a comparatively young girl in the days of the Covenanters in Scotland, who was going to attend a, a communion service on a Sunday afternoon. And of course, communion services were absolutely prohibited. And the soldiers of the King of England were all over the place looking for people who were going to meet together to have this communion service, which was prohibited. But this girl was going to the communion service. And suddenly, to her dismay, she went round the corner there, was a troop of soldiers, the dragoon. And for a moment she wondered what she was going to say, what they were upon her. And they asked her what she was going to do. And immediately she found herself saying this. She said, my elder brother has died. And they're going to read his will this afternoon. And he's done something for me and has left something. And I want to hear them reading the will. And they allowed her to go on. God hath not given us the spirit of power and of love and of wisdom, discretion, understanding. He'll make you as wise as a serpent. You'll be able to make an absolutely true statement to your enemies. But the enemy won't understand. And you'll go on. Oh yes, her elder brother had died. Christ had died for him. And in the communion service, the will was be read out again. And she was going to be reminded of what he'd left for her, what he'd done for her. You see, the most ignorant, the most nervous, the most timorous, in the agony, in the moment of crisis, is given the sound mind, the spirit of wisdom. Don't worry, it's not Christ. It shall be given you in that self-same hour. What he ought to speak, he'll tell you what to do, he'll tell you what to say, he'll restrain you. My friends, we are not left to ourselves, we mustn't think like ordinary people of ourselves, we are not natural men, we are born again, we have received God has given us the Holy Spirit. And he's a spirit of 
and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, those who are particularly prone to spiritual depression through timorous fear of the future, I say to you, in the name of God and in the words of the Apostle, turn up the gift. Talk to yourself. Remind yourself. Instead of allowing the future and its thoughts to grip you, and you're there sitting helpless and paralyzed, talk to yourself. Remind yourself who you are and what you are, what spirit is within you. And having reminded yourself of the character of the spirit, you will be able to go steadily forward, hearing nothing, living in the present, ready for the future, with one desire only, to glorify him who gave his all.